at the end of the racing season 1936, which wasn't so very successful in our company, uh, I was assigned to the racing department with the object of developing a new car uh, for the racing season 1937. Now, naturally, at that time, I hadn't any real idea about racing cars, and I took two racing cars of the type 1936 and went to the Newbridge ring with a few mechanics and started to learn driving a racing car. Naturally, that's the thing you've got to be very careful at. So I made up my mind not to go off the road on one of the first laps. And I made a point of going round the course slower than with a normal passenger car. And uh, to become quicker and quicker slowly. I used up two racing cars and I drove about 2,500 miles and after that I had an idea about racing cars. I could form an opinion what was wrong with the present racing cars and I had pretty well made up my mind uh, what one should change to improve for the coming season. First of all, you have to study the formula very closely because naturally you have to try and get everything out of the formula you can. For example, the formula in 1937 was maximum weight 750 kilograms. The size of the engine was unlimited. You could use a supercharger or not. You could use any type of fuel. And naturally, we tried to put in the largest engine we could. The first thing is you have to decide on is what sort of engine and then you go on to the other parts, the axles, the suspension and which is quite a difficult point for the supercharged engine was the tanks. The gas consumption of these engines was very high we had a capacity of just about 400 litres. I don't quite know how much that is in gallons, but it's, it's, it's a tremendous lot. And it was always very difficult to get these large tanks into the body of the car. On the 5.6 litre, we had a single a large tank at the back. But on later developments, when the gas consumption of the engines rose, we had to have a so-called saddle tank in front of the driver, which was built over his legs. And so the driver had a big tank in front of him and a big tank at the back. These two tanks were connected by uh, large diameter hoses. And naturally, if they had an accident, um, the danger of fire catching light was quite big. Actually, Seaman lost his life through an accident in Belgium when his car crashed against a tree and got torn in two pieces and the petrol started burning. But that was the only time that a fire occurred.
once the car has been designed, the best way to get it running as quickly as possible is to develop the individual parts of the engine and of the chassis on special cooling uh, equipment. For example, it is far better to try out the valve drive on a test bench because if a valve should break, it doesn't destroy an engine completely, it just falls off on a test bench. And we developed every single item of the engine, the valve drive, the supercharger, the connecting rod, on special test benches. And when we knew that every single part of the engine was safe, then we built up a complete engine and had it running. And this way, we avoided destroying engines through miscellaneous defects. And once the engine had been built up, we could trim it for power. We did the same with the axles, with the suspension, also, for example, with the tanks. We had them on a test rig and gave them a thorough shaking, which was much more than they could have an extra rating. So we didn't have any tank leaks uh, once the car was running. When we had the car built up, we took the, the complete car on a test bench and tried the car as a whole, tried the transmission, gear changes, the brakes, and when that was all right, then we went on to a racetrack, the Nürburgring, and started with the actual road holding experiments. If you rely on the capacity of your driver to win your races, you're going to be in trouble. Because a racing driver is only absolutely safe if you can afford to drive just under the limit which is possible. And that he can only do if his car is superior to his competitors. Once he has to go to the limit, then racing becomes, becomes quite dangerous and the probability of his going off the course or smashing his engine is very big. So the thing is to have a design which in a technical way is better than your competitors, then have good drivers and a good chance. Weighing in the cars before the race was a quite difficult matter for the different racing departments. Every company naturally had difficulty in getting their cars just under the limit of 750 kilos. And not all cars of the same type weighed the same. There was a difference, say, of 10 to 15 pounds. Now, if you are 15 pounds over the limit, the organizers are not going to accept the car, and you cannot know beforehand what the car is going to weigh exactly. Also, not all scales weigh exactly the same weight. So we generally went to the official scrutineering with a rather anxious feeling 
and we knew that all our competitors were going to stand there and have a good look and were going to be very pleased if we were too heavy. On one occasion, one of the cars was too heavy and the only possibility we found in that moment was to stretch off the paint which was white at that time and which had rather thick coating to make the panels look nice and uh, even. We had to scrape all this nice paint off, which had cost a lot of money, a lot of time, and uh, had to expose the blank alum uh, aluminium. We got off quite a lot of pounds and the car was inside the limits. And from that time on, our cars weren't painted anymore and they had this well-known aluminum color. Now, if you had won a race, sometimes you had to prove your car was inside the limits because the competitors and maybe the racing organizers weren't quite sure that after scrutineering you hadn't put something into your car. Of course it would have been possible if you were too heavy to take out some gears and only have the first gear in and leave without the other gears and for the race naturally to put them in again. So you, they weren't ever, never quite certain. So sometimes you had to prove after you had won a race that the car wasn't too heavy. And on one occasion I can remember that our car was actually a few pounds over the limit. Now in this case you can't take anything out of the car or everybody's looking on. <laughs> and uh, now the formula said that the car should be dry, that is without gas and without oil. And the only thing we could do was to disassemble the whole car and wipe oil off every single part of the car. And by doing that and assembling the car dry again, we actually got in, in the limits. But that was quite a, quite a narrow affair. <laughs> you have to put the best engineers and the best men on racing car development because you naturally never have enough time and if you make a mistake you have no possibility of correcting it and on each Monday you can read what you've been doing in the newspapers and the comments isn't always very friendly if you've had a disaster of some sort. So if a big firm goes in for racing, you've got to do it in a big way, you've got to spend a lot of money, and you've got to spend a lot of time on it. Racing is good advertising if it's successful, that if you aren't successful, it has a very negative effect. And uh, generally the non-technical department of firms comments rather unfavorably if you aren't successful. <laughs> Our firm has always raced for a certain amount of years. We have accumulated experience and then we have stopped for a certain time and up to now, beginning from 1895 I believe, or 93, we have always done the same. We have raced for a time and we have stopped again and we have started again. Naturally, 
we cannot say at the present if we are going to race again and when we shall race again. But maybe we shall keep our tradition which we have held up so long. Meine Meinung nach ist von allen Fahrern der ganzen Welt, ohne den anderen Weg tun zu wollen. In my opinion, and I do not want uh, with that now to give any harm to anybody, but in my personal opinion, I think the greatest driver ever has been Rudolf Karachola. Das resultiert zunächst daraus, dass kein Rennfahrer ununterbrochen so viele Jahre fuhr. A proof for my opinion is the fact that no other racing driver has been so successful for so many years continuously. But there's another point and that is the Caracciola has had a universal talent because he was as good a diver in any reliability trial, in any hill climb, in any record diving as in Grand Prix diving. Man muss aber in diesem Zusammenhang auch seinen Fahrstil nennen. Caracciola hatte ein angeborenes Talent, zu dem es in erster Linie gehört. Und dann hatte er einen Fahrstil, das heißt, er fuhr die sogenannte zügige Fahrweise, bei der das Lenkrad wie die Zeilenpötchen zart bewegt, nicht gerissen wird. But in this connection has to be underlined also the fact that Caracciola had a very personal style. He was a born talent. He did not learn to drive, but he just felt it. He, his style was kind of unique because it was so soft. It was very fast, but always soft, always elegant. And that was the secret. It was elegant, but very fast. Und diese zügige, weiße Fahrweise machte ihn auch zum besten Regenfahrer. And this fact that he was such an elegant, fast driver was also the reason why he was the best driver in the wet when it rained. Es muss auch an seinen Augen gelegen haben, denn wenn wir mit ihm mit dem Tourenwagen fuhren, und keiner mehr durch einen Regenfuß durchkam, setzte er sich an die Wände und wurde normal weiter. Das hat bestimmt gehalten. But part of the secret may also be his eyes, because he must have had uh, some over normal sight with his eyes. Because we, so many times we noticed, even in normal traffic diving, that on heavy rain, when no other diver could see anything anymore, Rudolf Karachola took the wheel or, anyway, continued to drive when all the others had to stop because they couldn't see anything.